very much. I appreciate that. Good playing. Amen. That's great. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Jude, the next, the last book in the Bible. So just find Revelation and then go until you find chapter one and then there will be Jude. Only 25 verses in the book of Jude. Um, but there is a theme all through the book of Jude that we want to focus on today. Now, there's several different themes, I guess you could say, going through the book of Jude. But there's one of them that I want to um, have us focus on today, and that is about love. Um, Jude, there's only one chapter. Out of habit, it just say chapter one. <laughs> but Jude verse one, all right, Jude verse one. I want to read Jude one and two. Let me ask you to stand one last time here as we read these two verses. Jude one, one and, uh, Jude one and two. There we go, one and two. And then we'll pray and get into the message. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God, Mercy unto you in peace and love be multiplied. All right, that's what we're going to be talking about today here today. We're going to look at love in the book of Jude. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. And I pray that you will bless your word today. Bless the preaching of your word. I pray that you'll bring to my remembrance the things I have um, studied. I pray that you'll um, just um, uh, may each, each word and each thing that I say or each thought, may it bring you honor and glory as we talk about your love. And thank you so much for loving us. Uh, Lord, help us in showing your love to the world. Bless in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Now, Jude was a half-brother of Jesus. Um, they had the same mother, but of course, different fathers. And of course, he, well, he identifies himself here as a servant of Jesus and as a brother of James. Those were the two brothers there, two of the brothers of Jesus. And what an honor it was for them to be able to write a book of the Bible. Now, by the way, he had to go with the name Jude because his name Judas, as he's also used in scripture, was kind of soured by the disciple that went, went astray, that went wrong, that betrayed the Lord as Judas. And so he went by the name of Jude. So that way there would be a, a distinction there. But notice this is what he wishes upon the people that would read his epistle, and that is that they that love would be multiplied in their life. Now, as Jude is writing his book, this is another one of the themes, the thoughts you can find through here, is he is warning the believers of people that would creep into the church and that can creep into your life. Let's read there verse number three. He says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was the once delivered unto the saints. Why? Verse four. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our, our God into... Now notice this next word, lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jude writes this book now and he says, I want you to be aware there are people that are gonna creep into your lives. They're gonna creep into the church and this is one of the responsibilities that the pastor has is to watch the church and to monitor the church and to make sure that false doctrine is not coming into the church. Now, this is where your responsibility as a Christian comes in is that you have to make sure that doesn't creep into your life as well. This is the responsibility of a husband. He has to make sure that this, that this, these false doctrines are not creeping into their home. Um, he's gotta make sure as a father that it's not creeping into the lives of the children. Uh, the mother needs to make sure these are not creeping into the lives of, of her children as well. We need to keep our guard up and we need to contend for the faith, earnestly contend for the faith. Remember that word there about contending for the faith there in verse number three, earnestly contend for the faith because our salvation is referred to in the scripture as the faith. All right, we are saved by faith. So that's why it's referred to as the faith. 
All right, we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we need to contend for that. We need to keep salvation the way God left it to us. And that is you repent of whatever is between you and God. Some people it is sin. They understand salvation. They say, I have no problem with, with trusting Jesus as Savior, but I don't want to change. All right, you need to repent of that. Some people, they're good moral people. They're not off into any kind of sin. They're not on any wanted poster. Uh, um, they, they have no warrants out for their arrest. Nothing like that. They're good moral people. Go into church faithful, but yet they're not believing the gospel. They're trusting in whatever their religion has told them. And they need to repent of those beliefs, of those false teachings, and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So remember that about the faith. We'll see that later as we continue on in this book. Now, we saw the word love, and now we see in verse number four the word lasciviousness. Lasciviousness. Now, we use the word today, lust. That's one that we use a lot more. And lasciviousness is when you have lust stirred up. Things that stir up lust, that is lasciviousness. And so he tells us and he warns us of this. There are gonna be people that are gonna creep into your life that are gonna bring a wrong love. He warns and he says, beware, they're going to creep into your life and they're going to come in and they're going to bring uh, uh, things that should not be in, the, in your life. So he's warning the believers of that. You and I need to be careful of this because as you sit and you watch TV, lasciviousness can begin creeping into your heart and into your life. As you're watching it, they begin normalizing things. That's one of the things that you have to be careful of with soap operas because they begin normalizing affairs and normalizing things that should not be normal. This is why, and, and by the way, that's something for uh, uh, women. A lot of times men don't get into it, but men a lot of times they can't even get into those. But men, they might get into a bad magazine that they would say, Oh, I'm just reading the articles. Yeah, right. <laughs> you see, it goes both ways there. There's a lot of times there are women that get mad at their husband and say, how dare you look at that stuff on the internet? But then the woman will sit there and watch all kinds of lasciviousness on TV. And maybe they still have their clothes on, but the storyline of what they're presenting and what they're talking about there is not very godly either. We have to be careful of lasciviousness. We had a dear sweet lady when I was growing up, Shawnee, Oklahoma. We had a dear sweet lady that came to our church faithfully. She was in a wheelchair. We had to wheel her in all of the time. Dear sweet lady, she would love to come in front of the church and sing as well. And I forget what the, the occasion was. I think she had to move. But there might have been something else that I just don't remember about. I guess I should ask my parents, see if they remember what it was. But we went into her house and we were helping her to box up some things. And maybe she was just uh, getting rid of some things. That, I forget what it was. She was a little bit older. And so I, I think, though, it was moving. I really believe that it was moving. But we went in there to help this dear, sweet lady. You would not have guessed it in a million years. But this woman had like the world's largest collection of romance novels. It was unbelievable to see that this dear sweet lady that came to church and loved to sing the songs and all of that, that here she was there at home reading those books. Hey, listen, lasciviousness. We have to be careful because people creep into our life that will bring these things. And listen, this is what our country is facing and fighting right now is we're bringing people, they're trying to normalize perversion. Now, it's one thing I understand about how girls will, will romanticize and will think, oh, that'll be so sweet to go on a picnic and, and they will, and they'll watch some of these Hallmark, a lot of those Hallmark things, you know, it's just, you know, harmless, you know, type fun and stuff like that. I'm not, I'm not talking about those type of, uh, type of things and, and, and those kind of uh, um, romantic ideas. And everybody has those things. As far as the girls have those, the guys a lot of times don't necessarily sit around and think about how wonderful a picnic might be. But anyway, um, I'm not talking about th those kind of things there, but here's Here's what our country is now facing is trying to normalize perversion and trying to say, well, as long as those men love each other, they love themselves. They, you know, love, right. Wait a minute. 
You're bringing lasciviousness and you're trying to normalize that. And there's already a lot of people that have started on this of well of trying to normalize a relationship with an adult and a child. Pedophilia, and they're trying to normalize that. We cannot normalize, we cannot allow these perversions to become normalized, and we have to be careful because then we ourselves can get caught up with this. That we can begin using little slogans of oh, love is love. No, no, no. You don't understand what real love is. Yeah. So he warns here about lasciviousness. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip down to verse number seven. There's another word that I want you to see. Look at verse number seven. He says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, talk about a place that normalized perversion, by the way. Notice verse seven. He says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to, and notice this word, fornication. Fornication. He says, in going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So he's warning the church, he's warning the believers, and he's telling them, he says, they're even as... And so he's warning that this is around where we're living. We've got to be careful because as the perversion became normal there in Sodom and Gomorrah, we have to be careful that it doesn't become normal around us. And then he uses that word fornication. Now the fornication is where it went from lasciviousness and lust being stirred up to now actually doing what's wrong. That's what the fornication is. The lasciviousness, it's in the heart. The fornication is when the body begins um, doing what is wrong. The body begins sinning. And so again, he's warning. And again, I, I bring out this message, this, this lesson to us here about love. We need to understand what true love is. We need to understand what true love is. A lot of times what the world will call love is not love, it is lust. And they'll say, oh, I'm in love. No, 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 you, you've got your hormones going crazy right now. <laughs> Let's slow down. Here's how you know of love is does it agree with the Bible's definition of love? You go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, a whole chapter written about love. We won't turn there, but I'm just saying you can go there and look at 1 Corinthians 13, a whole chapter about love. And then you can get an idea of whether or not you really love. You wonder, do I really love this person? Young person, before they get married, do I really love them? Well, go to 1 Corinthians 13 and compare it and see. You begin wondering, does that girl love me? Does that boy love me? Well, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's just one example. They're all through the Bible. There's teachings about love. And if we're going to know the love of God, we have to know what he says about it in the word of God. So Jude warns about lasciviousness, about lust being stirred up. He warns about fornication. Now, for time, skip on down to verse number 12. There's another word here that pertains to love as well in this, in this, in this book. He says, these are spots in your feast of charity. Notice the word charity. You write these things down here. You write verse love from verse one, write down lasciviousness from verse four, write down fornication from verse seven, and then write down charity from verse well, he says, these are spots in your feast of charity. Now, charity is your love in action. Charity is showing others the love of God. There are organizations that will call themselves charities. What are they doing? They're taking their love and actually putting it into action. They take money that people might give to them. And then they're um, uh, providing food or clothes or shelter or whatever that the charity is trying to do in helping people housing or, or remodeling housing or whatever it is. There's charities of where people will put love into action. You and I need to put love into action. It's, it's one thing just to say, I love you, but it's another thing to then show the person love, to do something and trying to help them in doing something to make their day in, in, in either a gift or in something you make or in some time or whatever it is, but our charity, our love. Now he warns, Jude warns, and he says, these people that would creep into our lives, he says they would become spots in your feasts of charity. I love a feast. That's why I love Thanksgiving. Amen. <laughs> That's why I like going to restaurants that have a buffet. <laughs> Amen. I like a feast. I like when it is spread out there. I love when we have church fellowships. And we go back there and it is all set out there. The church potluck and ooh, what a feast. Now, imagine this. 
Thanksgiving Day or at a church fellowship or wherever it is, you go to a buffet. Let's say you go to a restaurant there and you, you get there at the buffet and oh, you look over there and there is, I don't know what they're saying. Let's say macaroni and cheese. And you can't wait to get some. You look at it and say, oh, that looks so creamy and I want that. And you go and you go to stick your spoon down in there to scoop it out and to put it onto your plate and you notice a cockroach crawling around in there. That's just one little cockroach. He's God's creature too. He's hungry. <laughs> Are you going to eat the mac and cheese? Probably not. <laughs> That's what he says here with the spot. He says it just takes a little and it can ruin the whole thing. It just takes a little. And it can ruin the whole thing. We have to be careful because as we're trying to show love to people and we're trying to show charity, be careful because little things can, can ruin it. Little things can ruin it. And this love of the world can creep into our heart and can creep into our life, uh, uh, can become uh, something that we become involved with and it becomes a spot in our feast of charity. He says, what, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, Clouds, they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit with wind, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up right the root. And then Jude goes on describing them. And I love the way he describes them there. But for the sake of time, I won't continue reading that. Skip on down to verse 16 now. Skip on down to verse 16. We'll see another word here. He says, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after, here it is, their own Lust. Notice again, the, notice this word lust. We saw lasciviousness earlier. Now we see after their own lust. Lasciviousness can even refer to of the, the world and how the world is presenting things to you. And now we see here in verse number 16, it's your own lust. We all are drawn away of our own lust and enticed. And then when lust hath conceived to bring forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. We have to be careful of our own sin nature. We have to be careful of the lust that is there in our own heart. And so Jude is warning about these people and he says that they walk after their own lust. Notice what he goes on to say there in verse 16. He says, in their mouth speaketh great swelling words. Now, stop right there and think about this. What are great swelling words? What do we call that? We call it flattery. Great swelling words. Flattery. Be careful. Be careful of flattery. It'll change love. It'll change what you, you should know as love. Be careful of flattery. He says, having men's person in admiration because of advantage. You know what they really want? They want to take advantage of you. That's what you have to be careful with because they really just want to take advantage of you. Let's go on, verse 17. He says, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our uh, Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. And so he mentions their own lust again in verse 18. And we've been talking about this on Wednesday night about um, the mockers in the last time. We've been talking about the prophecy and of course how there will be people that will mock and, and laugh at it and, and ridicule the thought of the, the second coming of Christ. They're walking after their own lust. Verse number 19. Let me continue on. He said, these be they who separate themselves. Now notice this next word, sensual. You see this theme that's all through Jude? Again, he's talking about these deceivers and these people that creep in and he gives all kinds of different examples and I'll let you read all of that later. We don't have time to go through this book um, verse by verse, just trying to look at these, these thoughts through the book here. But notice he uses the word sensual. Now what are sens the, the sensual? That's when the lust is excited by the senses. The lust is excited by the senses. We have to be careful of our senses. What would that be? Well, your eyes. Let's start right there. Be careful what you look at because it can make you to become sensual to where that that's what you're listening to or is the sensuality inside your senses. How about your hearing? 
your hearing. That's why I, I warn people and tell them, be careful of music because music can break down your inhibitions. Be careful of the music. Whenever you, uh, you, you see maybe a TV or whatever it is, and some of you may very well know about bars, when you go into places like that, what do they have? They have music. Why? Because the dancing, the music, it breaks down the inhibitions. It's the senses. It's stirring up the senses. Um, it, you just start thinking about touch and how it stirs up the senses, it stirs up love. You have to be careful of these things because it then brings in a wrong love. And Jude started this book by saying he wanted love to be multiplied. And he's referring, of course, to the love of God. And we're going to see this here in just a minute. But Jude, as he starts off about the love, he then warns about all of this other fleshly love, lust, that can come into your life that can then hinder the love of God. So he says, but ye beloved, I'm sorry, verse number 19, these be they who separate themselves sensual. Listen to this next phrase here. Having not the spirit. Be careful who you hang around. Be sure to hang around those, be around those, have as friends, those who are saved. Those who have the Holy Spirit, they trust the Lord as Savior, they have the Holy Spirit in your heart. Now, we might have to have business acquaintances that are not saved. We might uh, have family members <laughs> that are not saved. We might have a neighbor. And I'm not saying you don't be friendly to people. We need to be friendly to everybody. They need to see the love of God. But be careful of who you're hanging out with. When they're not saved, they'll begin influencing you. And especially then, for the young people here that will one day want to get married, you don't want to look at marrying someone who is not saved. They don't have the spirit. When they don't have the spirit, they will see this world differently. You and I, we have the Holy Spirit. He reminds us of the word of God. He reminds us of, of, of uh, he convicts us of sin. If we're starting to go wrong, well, they don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't see it that way. They don't have the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They don't have the Holy Spirit reminding them of, of Bible verses and of things that they've done. They see things different. And so he warns here and he says, they're essentially says they have not the Spirit. Verse 20 now. He says, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Remember I told you from verse 3, we've only said to contend for the faith. I told you we'd see that again later in this book. And that is right here, verse number 20 says, we need to build up ourselves on our most holy faith. We have a faith that is without blemish because we have a Savior that is without blemish. We hold in our hand a holy Bible. It is a Bible without blemish. It is a Bible without fault. We have a salvation that is without fault. Why? Because it comes from the Word of God. It is a holy faith. And so he tells us to contend for the faith, but then now he tells us we need to build up ourselves. Now, when you're going to build up your strength, you have to do it on a regular basis, All right? If you get up and you walk around the block one time and come back in and sit down and then eat a dozen donuts or whatever, and then you don't do anything else until the next month and say on the first of every month, I'm going to walk around the block. Listen, you're not going to build up your strength. <laughs> I'm just telling that right now. You're never going to build up your strength. If you're going to build up your strength, you have to do it on a regular basis. Let me say this as well. If the only time you read your Bible is Sunday morning, you're never going to become a strong Christian. You yeah. will gradually get a little bit more strength, a little bit more, a little bit more knowledge in the Lord. You'll, you'll get a little bit more, at least by coming to church, but you've got to read the Bible yeah. at home. You've got to learn how to build up yourself. The pastor, we try to help you, but you know what? Hey, it's like a coach. Whenever a coach is trying to get the team in shape and he has them running and doing things. But you know the good athletes, the ones that are, oh, let's say, playing in the Super Bowl, the ones that are uh, making it to the professional level, you know what they've learned to do? They've learned to train on their own. 
Even when the coach is not watching, they get out and they run on their own. They even hire their own, they hire themselves a trainer that'll work with them. And they'll go out there to a hill and run up and down the hill and pulling weights and go into a, a weight room and, and are working out and there'll be somebody working out with them. And they've learned to do that on their own. They've learned they've got to build themselves up if they're going to get the strength and the endurance necessary for what is going to be demanded and asked of them once the, the game begins. And you and I need to build up ourselves because we are in a spiritual battle. And we need to be strong so that way when that day of temptation comes, when that hour of temptation comes, we are ready and we are strong. So we've got to build up ourselves. Now, he tells us three ways to build up our faith. Notice this as we're reading through here. He says, no, he says build it up yourselves. The first thing, he says, the last part of verse 20. Praying in the Holy Ghost. So the first thing that you can do is pray. You want to increase your faith? You want to build yourself up? You need to pray. Um, as we pray, we're showing God that we have faith in him. And then as our prayers get answered, it increases our faith. And then we want to pray more. And when someone else asks us to pray, we pray more with them about something. And that prayer gets answered. It increases our faith. We're building up ourselves. And notice he says you're praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, you can't pray out of the Holy Ghost. All right? Now, I'm, a, I'm maybe a lost person, I guess. Can't, but as a Christian, you can't pray out of the Holy Ghost. So when we're praying, he wants you to be aware of this. You are praying in the Holy Ghost. What a, a, a privilege we have to be able to pray and the Holy Ghost is right there with us, helping us. The Bible says with groanings which cannot be uttered, he knows the things that we really need and we're praying as we're praying. He is right there with us, praying in the Holy Ghost. Number two, look at verse 21. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Now, how did he begin the book? He says, love be multiplied. Now he says here in verse number 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. Now, as you hear this, if you just took this little phrase right out of there, keep yourself in the love of God, well, then you would think that there would be something you could do that would then put you out of the love of God. No, you cannot put yourself out of the love of God. Just as Romans chapter 8 and verse 38 and 39 tells us, the Bible says, Romans 8, 38 and 39, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principality, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You can't take yourself out of the love of God. He is always going to love us. There is nothing you can do that would cause God to love you more. There is nothing you can do that would cause God to love you less. Yeah. Yeah. But we need to keep ourselves in his love. So what is he talking about right there? Well, you think about a parent. And they have their child with them. And the parent tells the child, stay right here. The parent wants that child in their love, right close to them. The parent loves the child, but they want that child right there. The parent will even hold the child's hand to keep them close. But what do all children do? They want to pull that hand away. And you've got a hold of them, and they want to pull that hand away. And so then the parent, after struggling with them about that of holding the hand, the parent will then say, okay, I won't hold your hand, but you stay close by me. What does that parent say? They're saying, they're saying, stay in my love. Stay close by here. I love you. I don't want you getting far away. If you get far away, you're, gonna, you're the one that's going to get scared. You're the one that's going to begin thinking that I don't love you. You're going to be the one that's thinking I've left you. And so here's the little child at first and standing right there and mom is shopping in the store. Or mom is doing this or that and turns and looks and there's the little kid staying close by. All right, that's good. And then the mom is going along and turns over here and maybe another kid is doing this and that and they're looking at this other kid and, and they're going along and all of a sudden mom then turns around and the little one is no longer there. Mom still loves the kid. Mom starts turning around and looking and trying to find. Little kid is wondering. The little kid's the one that gets scared. The little kid's the one that thinks mom's left me. The little kid then is the one that begins thinking that I'm never going to be reunited with him again. That's what happens to us with the Lord when we get away from him. He loves us. And the Bible even tells us he is looking for us. Now, of course, he knows where we're at, but he's there searching for us. We're the ones then 
that become afraid. We're the ones then that begin thinking he doesn't love me anymore. And that's how the devil works as he comes and he says, you know what you did. God knows what you did. He doesn't love you anymore. <laughs> I'm telling you, he still loves you. Yeah. Amen. He'll still welcome you back. Sure. This is why we need to stay close to him is so that we know we're there in his presence. It's for our own assurance of knowing that he loves us. And then notice what he says, the last part there, verse 21. He says, looking for. So the first thing was praying. That's our faith. The second thing was keeping. That's our obedience. The third thing is looking for. That is, number three, our hope. Now, looking for, there's two different ways of looking at this. Number one, when you look for something you've lost. I don't know about you, but I have safe places. I have places where I put things and I say, I'm going to put it here because then I know I won't lose it. And then when I need it, I don't remember where my safe place was. <laughs> and I'm looking all over the place. Now, where is my safe place? I know that I put that there in that safe place, but now I've lost my safe place. Now, that's one example of it. Now, notice what he, let's read the verse here. He says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, do we have to look for that? No, we do need to search for the Lord and search for the truth. And once we find that, he gives us his mercy. He gives us his grace. He gives us eternal life. I don't wake up each and every day uh, I'm searching for eternal life. I will pray and ask him to forgive my sin and I'll pray and ask him for mercy in my life, but I don't have to ask for mercy for salvation in my life. That's already been taken care of. Here's what looking for also represents. One is searching for something that's lost. Two, you're looking for something you know is coming. It's like this. When you go to a restaurant, you sit down and you order your food. And then you're there and you happen to see your waiter or waitress coming your way. Man, you look and you are looking for that food. <laughs> you know this restaurant has food. You know they know how to cook. You've had it there before. You can smell food. Everybody else has food. And you know it's just a matter of time until your food comes and you're looking for the food. You're not searching for it. You're not scrounging around in the trash cans and everything trying to find something to eat. You know there's food there and you know it's coming. You're just looking for it. That's what this verse is telling us about. It's our hope, our hope. We're looking for how God is gonna answer. We know that he has all power. We know that he hears our prayers. We know that if we've asked according to his will, he's gonna answer that. And we're just looking for it, waiting for it, thinking, who is this it? Is this the time now? Is that the answer to my prayer? We're looking for that. That's what he's telling us up here. And our hope, especially as he points out here, of eternal life of heaven. We know that one day we're gonna be there in heaven with him. And that motivates us to keep Going. So he tells us three things to build up ourselves. And one of those there is a building up or keeping ourselves in the love of God. Now, this is, this is where we come to the conclusion now. Verse 22. We've been talking about love. Verse 22. He says, and of some have compassion making a difference. Compassion. That's the next word to notice Verse 22, compassion. Now let me say this. In order to have compassion and love on someone else, you first have to build up your own faith. You first have to have the love of God in your own heart. A lifeguard, before they can become a lifeguard, they first have to learn how to swim themselves. That's kind of important. You go to apply for a lifeguard job, there and you say, I want to be a lifeguard. And they say, okay, what are your qualifications? And then you say, well, I look like a lifeguard on a TV show. That's not going to cut it. <laughs> if you can say, oh, I think I resemble somebody that played so-and-so in such and such movie that had a lifeguard in it. And I, no, 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 no. If you're going to be a lifeguard, you first need to learn how to swim. You first need to learn how to swim very well. Then you need to know well, what are you going to do and how are you going to swim with someone else to be able to help get them to safety. And so if we are going to show compassion and have charity for those that need that, we first need to keep ourselves in the love of God. We have to have the love of God in our heart. And notice what he says there, that of some have compassion making a difference. He said, boy, they're a hard nut to crack. Well, why don't you try compassion? 
See how that makes a difference. Try it. Say, well, I did try that. I tried it one time last week. I did. I, I did. I bought them a Coke, and they, that didn't help at all. It might take a little bit more than that. It might take just a little bit more than that to finally um, get through. I've seen some of these videos. I'm sure you probably have as well. I've seen some online of an animal that's been abused. And then somebody gets the animal, for instance, like a, a dog that has been abused. And that dog at first is very scared and jumping because of, of the, the abuse that has happened to him. And it takes a while. It takes a while of compassion to finally get to where that animal can then trust you uh, um, to where that they will then understand that you're not going to harm them. It takes a while, but the compassion will make a difference. It's the same with people. Well, some reason why people are the way they are is because of the way that they've been treated their whole life. And then all of a sudden you come into their life and they think you're going to treat them just like everybody else in their life is treating them. And they need to see that actually, no, you're different. Actually, no, you, you, you don't respond the same way that those people used to respond and the way that others might respond. They see that, that you're different and the compassion can make a difference. This is what Jude is teaching us here in this book. Oh, I love this book here about the love of God. Let's pray and ask the Lord to have our love to be multiplied. Our feast of charity, not to have spots in it, and that we would keep ourselves in his love. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you will bless and help us. Lord, this world needs to see your love. This world sees what the world offers, what Hollywood offers, others offer as far as love. Lord, I pray that they will see what true love is through us. Lord, help us, first of all, to have your love multiplied in our heart. Lord, help us to accept your love. Lord, if there's anyone, either here in the auditorium or that's listening to the live stream, that needs to be saved, I pray they will accept your love into their heart. They will accept Jesus as their Savior. Lord, for those of us that we know that we're saved, Lord, may we be careful of those that are going to try to creep into our life to change our love, to pervert our love, to lead us down a wrong path. Please, Lord, help us and bless us on all the things that we've talked about this morning. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.